Well, good morning. My name is Terry Rarig, and I am a professor of National Security Affairs at the Naval War College. And I am delighted to be here today to talk to you about North Korea. So a lot of attention these days is focused on China and on Russia for the United States and the US military for good reason. But there certainly is also a lot of concern for North Korea, and in some respects, concern that it has been put a bit too far on the back burner when it comes to US security concerns. And North Korea's capability continues to grow, and yet not much seems to be occurring there. But yet the problem is that there are few clear options of what should be done and not much consensus around any of these particular options. Indeed, it is perhaps better to think about the North Korea situation as a problem that is not necessarily there to be solved, but one that needs to be managed. And so for the next hour, I'd like to talk to you about a number of different things related to North Korea, its internal circumstances, and the foreign policy, military elements, as well as US policy. And so I'll be focusing first a bit on history, then on North Korea under its current leader, Kim Jong-un. Then we'll talk about some of North Korea's military capability, both conventional as well as nuclear. And then we'll end with a discussion on US policy and what some future directions are. When you look at the map in the upper right, you will see Korea is divided. But that really represents a very small part of its history as North Korea, or excuse me, as Korea has been for many, many centuries a United State, and it has only been relatively recently that it has been divided. It has a long history again as a united country, and it has often been caught between the regional powers of Russia, Japan, China, as a country that has been even either fought over as the prize for their conflict or fought through as one has been trying to get to the other. And Koreans have a saying that goes something like, when the whales dance, the shrimp gets squashed. And they see themselves as the shrimp often caught between this conflict between the whales in the region. Fast forwarding a bit to the late 1800s and early 1900s, this is going to be a particularly tough period for the Korean Peninsula and for the Kingdom of Korea, as Russia, Japan, and China again are going to fight uh, for dominance in the region. And Japan is going to emerge as the dominant player. And that is going to begin a very tough period in Korean history. And the map on the left shows you the result of that. Uh, historical development. From 1910 to 1945, Japan emerged the dominant power and Korea was occupied by Imperial Japan for those 35 years, starting in 1910 going on through to World War, to the end of World War II. This period was a tough period for Koreans as the occupation was, was a brutal experience for Korea. But when the end of World War II was coming, Koreans were looking forward to their liberation, to their independence. The United States, frankly, had not done much planning for what to do with Korea at the end of World War II. And so when the war came to a relatively sudden end because of the atomic bombs, the United States gave two army colonels the job of figuring out a way of what do we do with Korea and the Japanese forces that are on the peninsula. And so they developed a plan where the United States would propose to the Soviet Union that the Russians would take the surrender of Japanese forces in the northern half, the United States would take the surrender in the southern half, the peninsula would be divided along the 38th parallel for that purpose. And then when, once this had occurred and the war was over, the two Koreas would be reunited and it would be again the norm of a single united Korea. The Russians accepted, but after the war ended, the Cold War already having begun intrudes on the plan of bringing the two Koreas back together and the two Koreas remain separate as a North Korea that becomes communist in the northern part 
and a South Korea that is relatively democratic under US occupation in the South, Russian occupation in the North. But that is going to be the circumstance for a few years. Until 1950, when North Korea decides to reunify the peninsula of its own accord and starts the Korean War. And we have three years of very intense fighting on the Korean peninsula that is going to end up after three years roughly having the dividing line that you see close to where the 38th parallel is, but on a bit more of an angle. And that is where the fighting concludes, and that is the current boundary of North and South Korea. The war ended with an armistice, which isn't a formal peace treaty. It is a ceasefire. There is a heavily armed uh, demilitarized, or excuse me, a demilitarized zone that on either side is heavily armed. And these two adversaries continue to confront each other across this dividing line. And so you have in this particular case then on the North Korean side, the cementing of the North Korean regime known officially as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or the acronym that you will often see, the DPRK. Their first founder, Kim Il-sung, ruled from 1948, the country's founding until his death in 1994. And then he was succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-il, who ruled from 1994 until his death in 2011. And so what you have emerging here is a dictatorship under essentially two family members, um, grounded in the Kim family as part of the leadership structure here. And you see in the middle a picture of the two statues that are in the capital city of Pyongyang. And you see uh, the size-wise, you see the people at the very bottom of that picture showing you how large these are. The regime created a, a clear sense of ideology of how North Korea was led by their father, the Kim family. And so the ideology of the Kim family is the leadership, uh, the father taking care of the children of North Korea. That is a, a key part of the country and is going to uh, continue to be part of North Korean ideology. When Kim, Il, or excuse me, when Kim Jong-il dies in 2011, he is going to be succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-un. And so you see that when it comes to knowing who the North Korean leaders are, you only have three to remember, and they're all related. Grandfather to grandson. And that, again, is part of the um, ideology of the North Korean regime, that it is that Kim family that is so central to the leadership of North Korea. It is surprising that, and, and such that Kim has been in power now for more than 12 years. You see the beginning of his rule in the picture in the upper left, which is the funeral procession of his father, Kim Jong-il. And Kim is the first one on the left side if you were facing the, the funeral hearse. And on the left side are the other civilian leaders. On the right side are the chief military leaders. Likely early in his rule, these people helped him get accustomed to what it was like to be in charge of North Korea, as he was a relatively young kid at the time when he was thrust into this leadership position. But over the years, he has taken on all of the chief positions of power within the government. He's the president of the state, the general secretary of the Communist Party, because of course, North Korea remains a communist state. And he's also the supreme commander of the North Korean military. But in addition to the titles and such, he has also purged a lot of individuals to remove threats to his power, but also to put in place people that would be loyal to him. And so the picture in the upper left, all of the other people except for him are gone. They have either been replaced and or executed. And in particular, two very high profile purges were first of all, his uncle, Jung Sung Tech. Not his uncle by blood, but uncle by marriage. Um, Jung Sung Tech was married to Kim Jong-un's aunt. 
but he became too powerful economically, politically, and was hauled out in a major meeting and a week later was executed. Very clear signal to the elites in the party and the military that even if you are a family member, if you become too powerful and a threat to the regime, you can be eliminated. A few years later, Kim Jong-un orchestrated the assassination of his half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, in the Kuala Lumpur airport in Malaysia. Two uh, young women were tricked into believing this was a prank of some sort. They went up behind him in the airport and put a rag soaked in VX agent over his, his mouth and he died within about a half an hour. Belief was that he was getting ready to possibly be turned by the CIA, but again, a family member who was too much of a threat to the North Korean regime and he was eliminated as well. So when you put all of these things together, it's pretty clear that Kim Jong-un has a very solid grip on power. There are no obvious sources of opposition to his leadership. Of course, that can be bad for your health if you decide to go that route. But nonetheless, politically, he seems to be fairly secure. One of the other interesting elements of the North Korean regime is the succession issue. As you saw already, that it is very important to be a member of the Kim family, and so far, three members. And when there is a, a, an illness or something that suggests that there might be a succession question, this raises a lot of, of consternation about whether the regime is stable and secure. Well, we had a very interesting event or turn of events in November of 2022. In the upper left, you see Kim Jong-un walking with a young woman who is his daughter, Kim Jue. They were walking at a missile test. The missile in the background there is one of North Korea's big ICBMs that we believe can reach the United States. But there he is with his, grand, with his daughter. It, maybe it's North Korea's version of take your daughter to work day. Uh, but nonetheless, she shows up many times after that most recent count is well over 25 different times where she shows up at different meetings, missile tests. In the lower part of that slide on the left, you see two other pictures where she is part of that. She's only 11 or 12 years old. The speculation is now that she may be already being groomed as the successor to her father when he may pass away. Now, it seems a little implausible that someone that young is being groomed to be the successor, but nonetheless, the South Korean National Intelligence Service is saying a lot about this seems to be the likely indication of what is happening here, but we shall see. The other possible successor that is sometimes raised in conversation is in the lower right, Kim Jong-un's sister, younger sister by a little bit, Kim Yo-jung, who you will often see uh, making statements that are <laughs> pretty harsh rhetoric against the South Koreans or against the United States, but a very trusted advisor to her brother and also possibly in the discussion of succession. Again, why all of this concern about these individuals and such at this point? Whenever there is a succession, when one of the, the Kim leaders dies, there was always a lot of speculation about who's next and is this going to be a stable transition and what does this mean for the future of North Korea? Does this possibly become a turning point where the regime changes? But Kim, again, is not that old. He's in his 40s. Um, he's got a ways to go. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily be putting a whole lot of, of effort into deciding what this all means. But nonetheless, it is one of the interesting stories to follow. We shift now to two things that the regime does seem to be concerned about, despite the fact that Kim um, has a stable and a secure grip on power. And that is the economic situation in North Korea and information control. Let me start with the economics. The North Korean economy, which is no surprise to most, continues to struggle. But if you are among the one to 2% of the elites in the party and in the military, 
life's pretty good for you. You are doing fairly well. You receive a good deal of compensation and access to luxury goods. As one example, there was just a recent story in January of a luxury mall opening up in the downtown, in the capital of, of Pyongyang, in the downtown area, stocked with all of the best foreign goods that, of course, only these elites can afford to buy. But this is the sort of thing that, that is, is done for these higher levels to be able to buy them off, buy off their loyalty, and give them a stake in the continuation of the regime. But for most of the other North Koreans, the country and the economy continues to struggle. A recent UN report indicated that 40 to possibly 50 percent of the North Korean population is food insecure and struggles to feed themselves. Even Kim Jong-un on a number of occasions surprisingly admitted publicly that he has to do more for the economy. He has to try to bring economic development, particularly to the rural areas, to the farm areas, to be able to have some of the economic growth such as it is, is, such as it is in North Korea spread to more diverse areas of the country. And in particular, Kim pledged this past January that he's going to have a number of major construction projects for housing and for factories in these rural areas to try to bring economic development to those areas. Why is the economy struggling? A number of reasons that I'd like to, to walk through here. First of all, the North Korean system itself has problems with it. As a communist system, a lot of top-down directives and, and guidance that isn't always the, the best for econ from an economic perspective, these things inherently part of the limitations on the North Korean economy. But also economic sanctions that have been in place for a number of years based on its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile tests have also started to, to have a big impact. And to show you some numbers to demonstrate that, here you see a short table of the numbers of the, the GDP growth of North Korea starting in 2016 to 2022. North Korea doesn't report this data, but this is what the Bank of Korea, which is like the central bank of South Korea, reports as their estimates. You can see in 2016 they had a 3.9% economic growth, and many analysts were shocked to see that that kind of level of economic growth had occurred. But then, starting in 2017, you start to see not even small increases, but decreases in most years except one. The answer, 2016 is when much more significant economic sanctions were put in place on North Korea in response to its nuclear and ballistic missile tests. Another element is the COVID lockdown. Uh, you may recall in 2020, as the COVID outbreak first starts to happen in China, reminder, when you look at the map, North Korea is right on the border. And North Korea was one of the first to have a almost complete lockdown of its country from any contact with not only China, but with others. That lockdown really hit the North Korean economy because China is the lifeline through trade and aid and other ways to keep the North Korean economy in afloat. That lockdown almost cut that off completely. So in many respects, the COVID lockdown had a bigger impact on enforcing economic sanctions than the sanctions themselves. And so the lockdown had a huge impact. North Korea has also had a lot of bad luck with weather, as it has often had in the summertime, droughts, floods, um, or both, and that has hurt the economy over a number of years. It's lacking investment capital. But also, certainly, the North Korean economy, small as it is, continues to drain off a lot of resources towards its military. North Korea doesn't typically report these numbers. And so one State Department estimate put for about a decade from about 2002 to 2014, an estimate that North Korea probably used about 25% of its gross domestic product, a quarter of its economy, 
siphoned off for military and, and security um, affairs. Two years ago, North Korea surprisingly reported that they said their percentage of GDP is at 15.9%. Well, either way, and, and in comparison, the United States is anywhere between 3 and 4% of its GDP. Either way, if it's 25 or 15.9, those are big numbers. And money that North Korea can, at least from its people and its, its economic livelihood, can ill afford to drain and funnel that much into its military. But yet it does. And so that continues to hamper the North Korean economy. But slowly but surely, we are seeing some things start to change. And two factors that I think are part of that. And one is North Korea is starting to slowly open up the borders. You are starting to see trade with China increase a bit as they are opening up rail and road lines for that sort of trade. Um, you are also seeing Chinese investment and, and investors coming in to look at projects. You are also seeing tourism increase in North Korea. Now you're wondering who goes to North Korea for a tourist trip. Well, they are trying to court the Russians in particular to have Russian tourists come. And in, and in particular, you see on the picture in the lower right, a ski resort that Kim Jong-un built a few years ago. And there are reports of several Russian tour groups coming to go ski in North Korea. And by the way, tourism is not covered under the international sanctions. So that's actually something legal that North Korea can do. And also, the sanctions enforcement are, is just sort of waning. In particular, Russia, given its uh, growing relationship with North Korea in regards to Ukraine issues, and I'll get to that in, in a few minutes, but also just sort of disdain because of the opposition that Russia is getting from the West over Ukraine. Russia is not at all interested in enforcing sanctions. China is also increasingly becoming lax in enforcing sanctions. And so you put these things together, and I think you're starting to see less and less pressure on North Korea in regards to the economic sanctions. And so some windows of opportunity from the North Korean perspective to be able to get out from under some of these different um, problems that have restricted its economic growth. One area, though, economically, where North Korea is doing just fine, as a matter of fact, uh, thriving, is in cyber theft. Um, it is one of the major countries and actors that is very successful in its cyber thievery. The North Korean hackers are very well known. They do not um, go out to try to take down sites to disrupt service. Two chief goals, to steal information, intelligence, and in particular, now they're going after the companies that produce computer chips because they want to get those designs to be able to manufacture, manufacture some of those themselves, and then just outright stealing money. And on the slide here, you see some of the examples of the amounts of money that they have stolen. And in the lower left, there's some of the examples of their high profile thefts. I think perhaps most eye popping is the 2022-2023 item there of 2.7 billion, 45% of the global total of crypto theft that year uh, was taken by North Korea. And so they are very successful in that regard. One other important concern that North Korea has, and this is really interesting, is the control of information. North Korea has been able, since its beginning, to carefully close off the types of outside information that North Koreans hear. And so from cradle to grave, the North Korean people hear about how great the Kim family is, how they take care of the North Koreans, how the threats from the outside are out to destroy North Korea, and how we need loyal members. We need you to follow the country's ideology. The Kim family is the father and the parents to take care of the children, obey, follow North Korea leadership, and all will be well. 
but increasingly there had been the, in, the influx of foreign information coming in through CDs, thumb drives, SD cards, illegally across China through the trade that was going on that I mentioned earlier between North Korea and, and China. And so in January of 2020, North Korea again imposed this very tight lockdown of trade and contact with China. And clearly there were important health reasons for doing that. But we also think now that there was an important political motive, and that was to shut down this foreign influence, this ideological pollution that was coming across the border in these different types of media. And in particular, North Korean leaders were starting to see the young kids in North Korea using slang that only the South Korean kids were using. They were hearing songs being sung, um, dance moves from some of the top South Korean groups like BTS and others that were extremely popular. How was this getting into North Korea? There was only one way that that was happening, and it was through these types of foreign media coming in. And so the lockdown was likely also, again, a political move to try to shut down this foreign interference. Also, trade with China was very lucrative for a lot of the individuals in North Korea that were involved in this, and they were getting fairly rich. And money leads to power, and we think that the North Korean leadership also felt that this growing class of wealthy traders could also become a possible political threat. And so shutting down the trade to China and contact with China took care of the ideological pollution and it also hemmed in these growing wealthy traders. And so that lockdown had a very important political element to it as well. In addition to that lockdown, North, the North Korean government has also implemented a number of increased measures legally to try to deal with this. And now bringing in a South Korean video or South Korean movies and dramas to be able to see what life was like in South Korea, which again busted the North Korean narrative because they would often tell the North Koreans, oh, you have it much better in the North. Look at our poor brother in, in the South. This foreign media was undercutting that narrative, but now they could see that for themselves. And you know, this was always illegal to bring this stuff in. But now they impose tougher measures in the, in the laws and tougher penalties. If you were caught using South Korean slang, a young kid could be sent to a labor camp for two years of hard labor. If you were caught watching a South Korean video that could be 15 years of hard labor. Parents of these kids could also be sent to hard labor. And if you were caught distributing, buying and selling these kinds of, of media sources, you could be executed. And we have a couple of reported examples of those executions. More border fences went up, patrols and surveillance equipment went up along the border with China. And it was also much more difficult to bribe the border guards to be able to get back and forth, which was an important way that this sort of illegal trade back and forth between China happened. I say all this because I think this is really important when you think about the North Korean regime. Look at all that they have gone through, all the effort that they have devoted to try to shut down this information flow it tells you what really worries the North Korean regime. And so they are clearly concerned with that outside information being able to get in. And I think is a very interesting point to watch as an internal threat to North Korea for its political stability as the years go on. Let us now shift to the North Korean military. And I have a lot of numbers up here not going to talk through all of these, but let me just make a few highlights. And I think it's important, I'm starting with the conventional military forces that North Korea has. 
We always get focused on the nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, but it's important to remember that there is a lot of conventional capability as well, and that needs to be considered also. So in, in the upper left, I'll sort of work my way around. Large uh, military under arms, the fourth largest in the world, that's the aggregate total number. If you do it on a per capita basis, meaning compare it to North Korea's population, they are number one in the world in regards to soldiers under arms compared to their total population. The KPA, or the Korean People's Army, on the bulk of that force, the 88,000 to 200,000, I use those two numbers because it depends on what you count, and you'll see that number in different, uh, different documents. But they are reportedly very well-trained, very well-fed, a very significant part of the North Korean military. Another key part are the artillery and the multiple rocket launcher systems. They are very close to the border and can hold Seoul in a great deal of threat. And for that, I point to the picture at the bottom. You see the gray area, the gray line that is just to the, the south of all of the black dots. That's the demilitarized zone, the border between North and South Korea. The black dots are the artillery positions and the multiple rocket launcher positions. The larger light gray circles are their ranges. The maroon area to the lower part of that, that picture, that's the metropolitan area of Seoul. You can see that a lot of those artillery positions and rocket launcher positions can reach the metropolitan area of Seoul. If the goal of North Korea is to be able to threaten the South, they didn't need nuclear weapons to do that. Their conventional artillery and rockets can do that. And so that's a very, very important reminder. Now, when you look at this slide, the numbers can be eye-popping. And you look at that and say, wow, North Korea's got a lot of stuff. But there are some big asterisks that go next to some of these numbers. And one of the first one comes in the number of tanks that they have, 3,500 main battle tanks. Except if you know your tanks and you look at those numbers, T-34s, T-54s, and 55s, those are old Soviet model tanks that would not do very well in a direct fight with South Korea and the United States. And so some of the North Korean systems, while a lot of numbers, are pretty old and antiquated types of systems. Moving to the, to the right, the Korean People's Army Air Force. Again, a lot of combat aircraft, but a lot of those are also old Soviet models. They also lack fuel and spare parts to keep all of these systems actually up and running. And their pilots train only about 20 hours per year in their airframes, a ridiculously low number compared to the typical training in the United States Air Force. And estimates suggest that if this Air Force went up against South Korea and the United States, it would not do very well. But again, big numbers, but the readiness and capability in question. The Navy is a relatively small Navy in regards to capabilities. It has only two ships that are the size of frigates, nothing larger. Most of the Navy is coastal patrol vessel, vessels. And remembering the Korean geography as a peninsula, the North Koreans have to split that force on two sides, and they would never be able to bring them together in a conflict to concentrate that force. And so their Navy has a whole lot of questions to it. One of the big numbers, though, that is, a, is of concern is their submarine force, 71 submarines. That is one of the larger submarine forces in the world. But those also are older Soviet versions that are relatively noisy diesel submarines that are fairly easy to track and um, would be you know, less threatening than what they show here. But on the other hand, numbers do matter. Now, you put all of this together again, the numbers are pretty interesting, but there are a lot of questions about readiness, and I've already suggested some of those in the systems themselves. 
But how would North Korea be able to sustain any sort of fight if it lasted for any particular period of time? What logistics capability does it have? Some of the, the estimates are that North Korea could only conduct or sustain major combat operations for maybe 30 to 60 days. That's not very long, and then all of these other things would, would come into play and North Korea would be in great trouble. But let me also add to you two pictures that I think also interestingly demonstrate problems that North Korea has in regards to readiness. Remember those construction projects that I mentioned earlier about trying to bring economic development to the rural areas? Here's one of the recent pictures of some of the people doing and helping that construction. The military is being called to help do some of this construction and make it fast. The military also gets called out in the fall, oftentimes, to help with the harvest. If the military is doing this and harvesting crops, they're not training to be a military. And so that raises some questions about their overall readiness, questions about how well fed the regular military is compared to the special ops guys. This is another interesting picture from 2017. This is a North Korean officer defecting. And he's hunched over as he's running across the DMZ. He's hunched over because he's getting shot at. He makes it, he gets to the hospital eventually, and as the surgeons are taking the bullets out of him, they realize he's got six to seven tapeworms in his stomach. That's not a sign of being a well-fed, well-cared-for military. If that is symptomatic of the broader North Korean force, uh, there are, again, more concerns in regards to the North Korean military. Switching now to the conventional forces. A little bit of the history about North Korea's nuclear story here, if you will. They've conducted six nuclear weapons tests, the latest in 2017, which was a fairly large one. As you can see here, the, the kiloton um, yield of that suggested to some that this may have been an effort to test a hydrogen weapon as opposed to a, a straight atomic weapon. There have been predictions for a number of years now that North Korea would be conducting its seventh nuclear test, possibly of a tactical nuclear weapon, to have a, a smaller yield. But so far, that has not occurred. Perhaps China has put enough pressure on North Korea um, to not test. China does not like to have those kinds of tests occurring. Um, but nonetheless, we continue to wait. Estimates of their nuclear weapons capability, and again, an estimate, because North Korea does not formally release these kinds of numbers, but we think that it may be somewhere between 20 to 30 assembled nuclear warheads, fissile material for another 45 to 50, production capability um, perhaps from uh, 6 to 18. As you can see, these numbers tend to give a range because we don't know exactly how much they may have. The delivery systems, North Korea has been testing and deploying a number of different missile systems, from ballistic missiles to cruise missiles to hypersonic glide vehicles. In the lower left, you see their big, long-range ballistic missile. This is the one where you saw Kim Jong-un and his daughter um, walking out earlier. It's a missile that we believe can reach the United States uh, in regards to range capabilities. Uh, one of the big questions is, have they been able to weaponize a nuclear device to be a warhead to fit on a ballistic missile? We are almost certain that they have done that with a short and medium range ballistic missile, which brings all of South Korea as well as all of Japan and US military bases in both those locations um, within range. But there's some question about whether North Korea has been able to weaponize a long-range ballistic missile because there are some increasing challenges with, an, an, with a long-range ICBM in regards to guidance and also re-entry vehicles. There is some debate among the missile people about whether North Korea has or hasn't achieved that. But North Korea will continue trying, and it still has an impact on defense planning, whether we know or not. One last item is North Korea is also working on a ballistic missile submarine. And you see 
um, a picture that they released back in August of a old Soviet submarine that they retrofitted. And if you can look closely at this picture, you will see in the extension back from the conning tower there, there are 10 different uh, launch tubes that are part of that. This is not operational yet. Um, it's the only submarine that they have of this um, version, but they are likely to continue working on this. Um, and somewhere down the road, they may have more of these submarines, and that is, of course, going to complicate the whole deterrence piece to this. Before I shift um, subject matter again, let me just make one other statement here about their nuclear program. It seems pretty clear that when you look at the conventional and nuclear capabilities of North Korea, they recognize that their ability to match modernization efforts by the South to match their modern conventional capability is going to be a losing battle for them, that they cannot match the South Koreans dollar for dollar. So instead, what they have done is gone essentially asymmetric and put a lot of their money on this particular side of the house by looking at um, their nuclear and ballistic missile capability. And also, uh, they do have a chemical weapons capability as well, and in addition, a biological weapons capability. North Korea also has had some interesting relationships with some others in the region. And so let me shift topics just a little bit here to talk about its relations with three key states in the region, Russia, China, and Japan. On the Russian side, this has been really interesting to watch over the last year or so as North Korea-Russia relations have gotten much closer. In particular, Russia has had the need for artillery ammunition for rockets, and there are very few suppliers who would be willing to sell Russia that, but North Korea is one of those that does, and it's compatible with Russian systems, not necessarily high quality. And so the Russians and the North Koreans have arranged a deal where the North Koreans have supplied artillery ammunition, short-range ballistic missiles to the Russian war effort, um, as well as rocket systems. And in return, the North Koreans have received cash and other sorts of assistance, in particular, technical guidance for their missile systems. Now, one of the big questions is, how much is Russia going to be willing to provide to North Korea? Are they going to part with some of their really sophisticated technology? I think there's some important questions and reasons to be skeptical of that. I think North, uh, Russia may not go to the extent of selling North Korea some of its, its most capable and modern fighter aircraft, for example, or some of its other very, very sophisticated missile technology. But I think the Russians will continue to provide some degree of technical assistance. Although that has been <laughs> perhaps interesting because um, just recently, the North Koreans tried to put a second military satellite into orbit, but the missile blew up um, as it ascended. So apparently the Russians have not have a ways to go before giving them the, the right technical assistance, or the North Koreans have a ways to go on that particular score. The relationship with China, of course, is a very important one for North Korea, but it's complicated. They have a long history together just simply because of their geographic proximity to each other and long, long historical relationship there. Ideological ties because of their communist systems and party-to-party -party relationship. And of course, China essentially rescued North Korea during the Korean War. And so those kinds of war bonds, very, very important. Still very close economic ties as that starts to open up with the COVID lockdown being changed and, and shifted. And some very important interests that they have together, and in particular that China wants to see the peninsula remain divided. They want a North Korea aligned with them to remain as it is, so they have an important interest. But their relationship is, is more complicated than sometimes is given credit in the media. 
In particular, it is often portrayed as an alliance. Yes, they do have a security treaty and there is some degree of a, a defense clause in it, but yet neither of the two sides necessarily trusts each other fully. The North Koreans are concerned about the dependency they have on China economically and for security. They are worried that China would throw them under the bus if it were in their interest. The Chinese often are upset with North Korean behavior and in particular, when they test nuclear weapons, the Chinese are not happy. Remember all the UN sanctions that were put in place on North Korea? China voted in favor of every one of those because they don't want nuclear testing. They want stability. And North Korea doing all of this testing decreases that stability in the region. So it's a complicated relationship, but yet certainly a relatively close one and common interest between the two. Lastly, the Japan relationship, or lack thereof, is a really interesting and, and frankly a bizarre story. North Korea and Japan do not have formal relations. They have not settled accounts since the occupation that, of course, remember, Japan occupied the entire peninsula. And the key sticking point is the abduction issue. In the late 70s, early 80s, North Korea reportedly abducted um, a number of Japanese citizens. Special ops people would go under cover of darkness, go on the beaches of Japan, kidnap a Japanese walking the beach, walking the sidewalk, take them back to North Korea to help with uh, training their intelligence agents in Japanese culture, Japanese language. Um, possibly even if they could turn them as, as an agent, etc. Japan has never had a full accounting from North Korea of these different individuals. And until that could be settled, it is unlikely that there is going to be any sort of formal relationship. And perhaps one of the most sad stories of this is the picture below. You see the parents of a young Japanese girl who was 13 years old when she was abducted. And those parents still have not had a full accounting of them. Um, some of the Japanese abductees have returned. North Korea maintains the rest have passed away, but there has been no effort to try to bring remains back to Japan or have a full accounting of that. That is going to remain a sticking point between North Korea and Japan before there could be any sense of possible normalization of relations between the two. So with all of this laid out as the context, how do you deal with the North Korean problem? What is the possible policy alternatives for dealing with North Korea? And so let me conclude with a few thoughts about some of that. So what comes next? What do we do with this challenge of North Korea that again, many critics would argue has not been receiving the attention that many think it should? So to summarize here, first of all, what's the current Biden administration policy? And it has a, a number of bullets here and let me just walk through a couple of these because I think these are very important pieces. First of all, the goal remains the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Well, is that really possible at this particular point? If you ask most Korea analysts, they will tell you that is not possible any longer. And if it is, it is really, really a long-term possibility. And even that is something that is unlikely. Well, why do we continue to keep holding to denuclearization as the policy? And by the way, that is in lockstep with South Korea and Japan. All of our documents maintain that as the goal. Two essential reasons here. First of all, because our allies are so concerned about North Korea, and the security challenge it continues to pose in the region, denuclearization is going to have to be on the table for working with Japan and South Korea. But also the non-proliferation community is very concerned about this. And, and they would point to this sort of notion. If you suddenly decide, okay, denuclearization's off the table, we are going to accept North Korea, maybe not formally, 
but even de facto as a nuclear weapon state. What message does that send to other potential would-be nuclear proliferators? Does it tell them, yes, the international community gets angry for maybe about 10 years, they'll impose sanctions, but if you can make it through 10 years or so, they'll get tired, they'll remove the sanctions, and then on we go forward. That's a bad message from this community and others to say, um, you know, let's, let's accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. And we are also concerned that if we accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state, that may prod South Korea to go nuclear, and we don't want anyone, allies or otherwise, to acquire nuclear weapons. So that remains the goal, if you will, of US policy. Just recently, we said publicly that we would be willing to take interim steps. South Korea and Japan got very concerned that that meant that was a partial acceptance of North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. But that really wasn't what was intended. It was just saying that even if denuclearization is possible, it's going to take time, it's going to take a series of interim steps to get us to that particular point. Then the policy when it first came out in early Biden administration said, but we will not focus on achieving a grand bargain, which was uh, a comment on Trump administration policy, nor rely on strategic patience, which was suggesting that we're not also going to be following the Obama administration policy, which was usually categorized or labeled as strategic patience. But I think most analysts would say the Biden administration policy looks an awful lot like the, Biden, uh, uh, the Obama administration's policy of strategic patience. Um, until that time, or excuse me, the Biden administration will take a calibrated approach and that the United States and others are open to dialogue at any time without preconditions. But the North Koreans for the last number of years have been uninterested. Uh, we have made many offers for dialogue and I think from a North Korean perspective, they look at this policy and see denuclearization is still the goal. We have said we are not going to denuclearize. You say no preconditions. Yeah, but denuclearization is still likely to be the central goal of these talks. So we're not interested. And I think that's likely to be the North Korean position for some time. Until that time, sanctions are going to continue to be in place. And we will also continue to consult with our allies, especially South Korea and Japan. And I think an important statement here about some, some developments. As you recall earlier in the talk, China, uh, South Korea and Japan had a tough history with the um, occupation of, South, of Korea by Japan. Korea-Japan relations have long been very, very difficult. But over the last two years, there has been unbelievable progress in Japan and South Korea coming together and that creating the opportunity for trilateral cooperation between the three allies. And so the picture that you see there below, for many years those kinds of pictures would have had to have been photoshopped. This is a real picture of the August summit last year at Camp David, a very important symbolic gesture to host this meeting there to show trilateral cooperation between these two and an important step forward for these three allies to work together. U.S. policy also under Biden has been much more willing to criticize North Korea's human rights record because North Korea is a human rights disaster and has example upon example of how it is a violator of so many different elements of oppression and such that uh, Sometimes different administrations don't always call out North Korea to the same degree, but Biden has been willing to do that. So again, many have argued this policy has not achieved much. It has been stuck in neutral. We've been focused on China and Russia again for good reason. But the critics again say this is putting this on the back burner too far and needs to be given much greater attention. But the challenge is, what would that attention look like? What policy should be the direction? 
And in that case, here is where we get to the issue of the lack of consensus about what to do next. First of all, do you stick to denuclearization as your goal, or do you have some other goal that you have in mind or somehow finesse that denuclearization goal, knowing how this impacts the um, relations with Japan and South Korea? But let me also say that I'm, go I'm going to suggest three other options here that, that have been proposed. All of them start from the starting point of a strong US alliance with South Korea and Japan for that matter, as well as a focus on deterrence, that we have to continue to have a robust deterrence posture to make sure North Korea knows that it cannot invade and use nuclear weapons. So here are the three different options. First of all, there are those who argue we need to exert more pressure on North Korea. The only way we're going to get North Korea to either give up its nuclear weapons, or even better yet, collapse the regime, is turn up the pressure that we have more sanctions, we cut off, cut off their access to cyber hacking, that we don't let them get away with all of the different testing that they do, that we punish them harder in those regards. And a number of other elements there that are part of increasing the pressure, that's the ticket to being able to get North Korea to change its position. On the other side of the coin are those who say, yeah, how's that been working so far? Um, all it's led to is North Korea has been increasing its military capabilities, its nuclear and missile capabilities. We are headed down a path that it's only going to get worse we have to put together a package that reaches out to North Korea and gives them some upfront indications that we are not out to take down North Korea, that we were perhaps going to relax some of the economic sanctions that are in place, that we are willing to have engagement, perhaps even exchange the armistice for a peace treaty and normalize relations with North Korea, that we move in this direction. Now, of course, the pro-pressure people say, yeah, and we've tried that too, and that hasn't worked. And you can't trust North Korea because they will sign any agreement and you are being naive because they won't follow it. So these are sort of the two extremes, if you will. In the middle is a third option that essentially argues we are not going to get to denuclearization anytime soon. And so we are going to need to somehow manage this issue. And so this argues the future policy from more of a risk reduction, try to achieve stability, to be able to contain North Korea's growth. Maybe this could be dealt with as an arms control challenge. Could we get North Korea to probably agree to some sort of testing moratorium, which would help restrain their capabilities, the size of their, their um, missile force, their nuclear force, be able to do some of those kinds of things, bring conventional weapons into the discussions as well. That somehow we could try to manage this issue without necessarily allowing tension to keep growing and the rhetoric to continue to be problematic and that we bounce from crisis to crisis, but that we're not likely to get to denuclearization. Well, none of these are easy solutions. And of course, reaching out to North Korea politically in the United States has very, very little support from anyone to be able to do that. But nonetheless, um, the problem is going to remain and it is going to be a very, very tough one and likely to be the case whoever the next administration or two is going to be. So let me just conclude by saying that um, the North Korean and nuclear problem is not going away. Um, it is going to continue to be a challenge for the United States and for the region. It is something that is going to require attention, and, and I think more than has been the case over the last several administrations. But yet what that answer is is going to be difficult, and the solution set is not very easy. So let me stop and say thank you very much, and to all of you, good luck in your future Navy career. <laughs>